fishing. It's now a term that doesn't really require much of an introduction. The frequency at which it's employed by cybercriminals and its high rate of success, even within large corporations with strict cybersecurity measures and regulations, has made this mode of attack extremely popular. However, even if you have heard of it, let's reacquaint ourselves with what exactly phishing is in the off chance that you may have any false preconceptions. Phishing is a type of social engineering attack, which is a type of attack that requires human interaction. It's employed with the intention of taking advantage of human weaknesses in order to deceive its targets and bypass security procedures. It's often carried out by email, but may be carried out through phone calls and SMS as well. Hello? You have a collect call from Microsoft. Your computer security subscription is expiring. Please call this number to renew your subscription. One of the oldest and most popular phishing scam is the 419 scam, more popularly known as the Nigerian Prince scam where a supposed wealthy Nigerian prince needs to urgently move a large sum of money and requests a small advance payment for the move or requests your bank details to, quote, keep the money safe. And in return for the favor, the Nigerian prince will promise to share a portion of his wealth with you, which could be a percentage of millions or billions of dollars. Sounds like a great deal, right? Well, what the supposed Nigerian prince here really does is he either completely empties your bank account and moves the money to himself or keeps requesting additional payments till you finally realize that it was all a huge scam. Now, this is a fairly simple scam and you might ask who would actually fall for this? Remember, this is one of the oldest phishing scams in the book. This existed before email and was carried out through fax machines and phone calls as well. And back then, awareness about scams such as this was almost non-existent within the general public, which meant lots and lots more people falling victim to it. Variants of the Nigerian Prince scam are still active, although not always featuring a Nigerian Prince. Sometimes it's employment, lotteries, and even romantic interests on dating sites. CNBC reported that in 2018, over 700,000 US dollars was lost by Americans to the 419 scam. Phishing has evolved over the years though, and there are much, much more complicated phishing scams all over the internet. And as you can see, regardless of how outlandish and ancient the scam is, it still rakes in an enormous amount of money. As humans, we are susceptible. We're not programmed in any single way. Our behaviors can often be predictable, but at the same time, unpredictable. We go through so many emotions a day. Joy, sadness, fear, anger, frustration, guilt. These emotions lead us to pride, overconfidence, greed, the need to be recognized, the need to be anonymous, the need to take immediate action or to procrastinate. These emotions are gateways to the situations we find ourselves in. The same emotions that can make us strong in certain aspects can make us vulnerable in others. Social engineering is the art of deception, a tool for psychological manipulation. A common trick in phishing is to create a sense of urgency so that we think as little as possible before falling for their trap to create a sense of trust by pretending to be someone we know, to create fear to cloud our thoughts and hope we make a mistake. It's a tool that understands that vulnerabilities like this exist in human beings and that it can be taken advantage of. No matter how intelligent we're capable of being, how high our IQ, how great the education and trainings we've received, under just the right circumstances, we're fools, prone to be deceived. In 2017, during a Black Hat conference, a security engineer from Stripe named Carla Bennett spoke of why people are so vulnerable to phishing and how psychology plays a role. 
She brought up Daniel Kahneman's two-system theory from the book Thinking Fast and Slow as an example. In this book, the author Kahneman speaks about the dual systems in our brain, System 1 and System 2. This system is a good answer to the question of whether you're conducting fishing training right. Although fishing training is supposedly employed by a majority of firms, we're still seeing countless successful phishing attacks worldwide. Proofpoint's 2021 State of the Fish report shows that, though many employees responded that their organizations do indeed provide security awareness training, with phishing taking the top three types of training, most of these firms also experienced a successful phishing attack the same year. So why is this the case? It's no secret that a lot of organizations look at phishing training and prevention as a means to only meet compliance, instead of considering a lot of the security risks that come along with it. This is fine, as long as implementation is done right, compliance is met, and your organizational security is heightened. As long as results are achieved, motive doesn't really matter. However, if motive influences the quality of the implementation and therefore the effectiveness of the result, of course that poses a problem. A few things did stand out to me on this report though and I think it's worth mentioning before we get to the crux of the problem. Firstly, although a significant amount of organizations provided monthly trainings, a good majority also responded with quarterly, which is in most cases too infrequent. Second, a very low number of organizations seem to be providing simulated phishing training as a majority only seems to provide formal training sessions though most respondents seem to agree that there has been a quantifiable reduction in phishing attacks, this is not a great metric to decide if it has been effective enough. The problem with phishing is that it only takes a single employee clicking on a malicious link to put the whole organization at risk. Even if 99% of your organization doesn't click on a malicious link, all it takes is that 1%. Let's move on to understanding your brain against phishing. Starting with Daniel Kahneman's theory, on the first chapter itself, you'll find the introduction to the two systems. System 1 is fast, it's automatic, it's based on intuition, instinct, and it takes minimal effort as those are actions that have been molded into your brain through common sense and experience. While System 2 is slow, but rational, it employs logical thinking which often takes time and effort. A good example is when you walk into your room and you need to turn on the lights or the fan. You intuitively know which is which if you've lived there for quite a while, as opposed to walking into a new room and figuring out which switches correspond to which. While the first scenario employs system 1, the second employs system 2. This can be applied to many things we do that we've practiced for a long time. This is why it's more difficult to change a habit, the way you sit, sleep, type, the things you do so often that is described as mundane. To a busy employee who spends most of their time checking and responding to emails, checking their email is a mundane task. The primary reason something like this exists is so that you don't overexert your brain and reach cognitive exhaustion much early in the day. A large part of why a lot of highly successful people wear the same thing every day. It allows them to skip deciding what they should wear. It leaves decision-making power for when it's really needed. If you had to consciously perform every little task in a day, you would not be able to allocate your mind efficiently to the task that required that much attention. But due to the speed and effortless nature, it also ends up being more prone to errors. A lot of organizations providing phishing training almost always assumes that employees are using System 2, whereas more often than not, it's System 1 that's in use and is doing the damage. And unfortunately, subpar trainings only reinforce this. Assume that you announce to a bunch of employees that this week, you're hosting simulated phishing attacks. The employees are bound to be more careful and when checking their email, they'll utilize system two more often as they expect something to go wrong. After training week, they become immediately less aware. It makes the entire exercise futile. Now imagine you tell your employees that you initiated simulated phishing training and that they could expect one anytime. This forces employees to be more vigilant and prohibits this vigilance from sticking to a certain time frame. I'm sure you might have noticed an obvious issue here. If employees' minds are always looking out for phishing emails, spending a lot of cognitive function, 
doesn't that mean that they have less of their cognitive function remaining for other crucial tasks? That is unfortunately right. I wish I could say that System 1 could be trained, but Daniel Kahneman even states that System 1 isn't something that's educable. You can't exactly train it to be error-free. Rather, a much more effective strategy is to promote System 2 thinking only when it's required. An article by The Conversation shows that even experts deal with phishing attacks by the discomfort they feel when they read an email. Certain things that just feel off and warrants an investigation before proceeding further and confirming the legitimacy of the email. A way of thinking that saves cognitive function is to utilize System 1 like you do every day and switch to System 2 when necessary. The idea is to have your mind to pick up these small details by instinct. This requires employees to really know the components that are often found in a phishing email, and then couple this with frequent and unexpected simulation trainings. People aren't vigilant of phishing attacks because of how rarely they occur to them as an individual. It's painful to watch out for something that may never happen, but make it something that they'd see every other day or week and out of schedule, it soon adds to experience. Training someone to identify phishing, in my opinion, is less than effective when it comes without the element of surprise. Unfortunately, I understand that this is something controversial because it comes with the added responsibility of worrying about employee satisfaction and the challenge of how you can reduce how intrusive it is to their primary role in their organization. And this is something that organizations need to tailor a solution for. It could be gamifying phishing training, providing monetary or non-monetary rewards for their vigilance and frequency in identifying these simulated attacks. It even could be performance reviews that really take these results into consideration. However, frequency and the element of surprise all depend on the quality of the training. Dishing out emails that are so obviously phishing attempts and doesn't require any real cognitive thinking will not be fruitful. Neither will they be received warmly by employees as it just feels futile and bothersome. Instead, the key is to shuffle the difficulty of these emails ranging from the obvious to custom mails targeted to specific people, ones that may even almost be indistinguishable from a legitimate email, but still ways to tell them apart with a keen eye. One other benefit of repetitive simulation trainings with varying difficulties is that it brings down overconfidence, another flaw of the human mind. When someone is so confident in their ability to not fall for a scam, this works against them and even halts the utilization of System 2 thinking. With advanced simulation phishing trainings, when employees do fall for these simulated attacks, it brings them to the awareness that they may not be as invulnerable as they initially thought. Here's something I feel need to be addressed as well. Another one that may be controversial. How do you deal with the employees that fall for phishing? There's many ways that phishing has been dealt with. Looking at the same report we looked at earlier by Proofpoint, the answers here range from counseling all the way to termination. I don't believe that termination or harsh consequences in general are a great way to deal with mishaps. That being said, the dangers of falling for a phishing email is consequential. And it's hard not to see the viewpoint of certain organizations that practice such harsh measures. I definitely don't believe a single mistake warrants such action. Even experts can falter and this is something that a lot of organizations need to acknowledge. No one can ever be fully secure, only experienced and therefore educated enough to defend against these attacks to the best of their abilities. A case I look to that happened quite recently is Jim Browning's YouTube channel. Jim Browning is a scam baiter. He contacts call centers dedicated for scams, chats with them and eventually exposes them. He is very technically skilled, hacking into CCTVs of these scam call centers, monitoring and exposing scammers. He's been doing this for quite a long time and three months ago he released a video called My Channel Was Deleted. How? In this he describes a phishing email he received from someone claiming to be from YouTube support. Although this email was not so special in the way it was crafted, coincidentally the scenario described by the scammer seemed as if it was possible to Jim, as he had just managed YouTube from a new phone, and so he assumed that maybe it created a duplicate AdSense account. As described on the phishing email, the scammer warns Jim that his YouTube channel is in risk of permanent deletion. Out of the panic of losing his account with over 3 million subscribers and the coincidence that came into play, 
He replied to the supposed YouTube support and eventually ended up with a deleted YouTube channel. Thankfully, a few days later, with the help of YouTube support, he was able to recover it. Of course, this was just one incident that I'm picking out, but the point is, even to those who are used to dealing with scams every day, including even cybersecurity experts, although they're less likely to fall for such attacks, the chances are, without exception, never zero. This is because, as we've seen from Jim Browning's story, success can even depend on circumstance. Phishing emails are crafted to succeed in some way. They are to cyber criminals sometimes an art form, the success of which depends on the successful manipulation of the human emotions, the weakness that's a side effect of our vulnerabilities. So if everyone can be deceived to some extent, is it really fair to judge someone by a single or maybe even multiple mistakes? When it comes to repeat offenders, I do believe that drastic measures may be necessary or measures at least consequential enough to raise an employee's willingness to be vigilant to such attacks. What this obviously means is that you can never 100% secure your organization against phishing threats. Only raise your organization's quality of response to such attacks and the technical countermeasures that they can rely on as a fallback. Cybersecurity is more than just a technical field. The fact is, at this point in time, humans are almost always involved in an organization's security. And not just the IT or the security team, but the entire organization plays a part. From the doorman to the CEO. It's not just our work lives, but also our personal lives that can get caught in the crossfire between a hacker and what they want to obtain. A phrase that has been repeatedly mentioned in the field is that humans are the weakest link in security, which is still arguable, but regardless of the truth in the statement, it's clear that humans are a major target for cyber criminals. And that's no surprise because hundreds of simple phishing emails have led to some of the most horrifying cyber attacks. It's quite clear that humans are so much more vulnerable because of our emotions. And the fact that all it takes is one person in an organization to have a bad day in order for them to fall for a phishing attack and really jeopardize the entire organizational security really drives home the danger it possesses. Our awareness, knowing that phishing exists, knowing the elements that make up a phishing attack, and knowing that we're exceptionally vulnerable to those attacks is the key to fighting against one of the most dangerous cyber attacks in the world. While this video focused on what we can do to fight phishing with the understanding of our psychology, I hope to make this a series and really take a look at the multiple ways in which we can combat phishing. So do leave your recommendations in the comments below and I would appreciate it if you could help spread the word. If you genuinely enjoyed this video, give it a like and as always, thanks for watching and I hope you have a fantastic day.